Okay, you're ready to go. Or hey everybody, uh, welcome to the TikTok uh, legality and constitutionality uh, panel. Uh, my name is Kurt Opsahl. I'm the Associate General Counsel with the Filecoin Foundation that focuses on cybersecurity and civil liberties policy. Uh, and let's go down the line and introduce ourselves. Sure. Hi there. Um, thanks for coming out. My name is Corinne McSherry, and I am the Legal Director with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. If you're not familiar with us, we're a digital rights group that does litigation. I run the legal team. Um, we also do a lot of some lobbying, um, we do a lot of grassroots activism, and we also have a technologist team that builds tools to protect your privacy and security, and then also teaches people how to use them. So pretty much if it involves digital rights, in the U.S. especially, we are probably involved in one, um, one way or another, um, and we're there fighting for the user every time. Thanks. Hi, I'm Ron Daniels. I'm a attorney in middle Georgia. I have a pretty wide ranging practice. Uh, part of my practice is consumer protection issues. Uh, I do occasionally get in some constitutional rights issues. Uh, I am probably the, the, the least qualified of our panelists <laughs> to talk about this, but uh, I'm here nevertheless. All right, thank you. Um, also, Should we get, get started? Yeah. Okay, so, um, so as you may have heard, um, there are some current concerns about um, TikTok that have been percolating around for the past few years. Um, and sort of the core of them is that TikTok is collecting lots and lots of information about all of its users and sending that information to the Chinese government. That's kind of just the blunt core issue. Um, that's been raised and kind of sending it which part of the argument is like well it is the Chinese government but anyway we'll set that aside for now. So um, there have been efforts in Washington to address this issue. There's a concern that this poses a national security risk and when the executive branch sees national security risks it thinks it should do something about them and Congress <coughs> feels the same way. Um, and so there have been a few different proposals to try to ban TikTok um, at a legislative level. There's a, a proposal called the Restrict Act, which we, we can get into the nitty-gritty. I'm just going to give you kind of an overview of it. Um, there's the Restrict Act. There have been state and local governments that have just banned um, government employees from using TikTok. Um, and sort of other efforts at, at multiple layers of government to try to limit um, at least their own employees using TikTok, but also there are some people who think we should just not let anyone use TikTok because it's just essentially a weapon um, for our foreign adversaries. Um, so we're here to talk about what some of those proposals are and um, whether we think they can, whether they're lawful and whether they can pass constitutional muster or not. Um, jump in? Sure, sure. So, uh, yeah, I want to add on to that a little bit uh, with some like history and, and perspective is that this has been going on for, for a number of uh, years. Uh, in I think 2020, I believe it was, uh, uh, then President Trump uh, tried to institute a TikTok ban uh, by executive order. Um, and that was that was early on in this uh, in this process. Perhaps not coincidentally, this occurred not long after a bunch of people organized on TikTok, uh, mainly people who are into K-pop, uh, to get tickets to one of Trump's rallies, and then uh, they didn't show up, and this caused some embarrassment to the Trump administration, uh, and then he went to go and, and uh, go after TikTok and its parent ByteDance, and also WeChat uh, at, at the same time, uh, and that had a, you know its own set of problems. What can the president do under executive orders? Uh, and uh, there, the uh, IEPA, but now I'm trying to remember what the acronym stands for. You have that one? Yeah. All right. Congress has a law that, that regulates <laughs> what you can do on sanctions, trying to make sure that the sanctions power uh, that is granted there, giving the president some authority to sanction uh, uh, companies uh, who are you know doing business with adversaries and such, doesn't unduly restrict freedom of expression. 
uh, and something you know, the idea behind that that restriction is to address concerns when uh, say you know technologies or you know American uh, media or other things that would be promoting of democracy and freedom of expression in authoritarian regimes don't get uh, uh, you know um, banned by uh, overzealous uh, sanctions uh, and that uh, posed a big problem with having a sanction on a, a tool which was used by people you know all over the world as a means of, of communication um, and uh, that was uh, uh, litigated uh, and uh, ch challenged and litigated uh, but then became moot when uh, Trump lost the election and therefore uh, his executive order didn't go forward but then resurfaced in some of these uh, these congressional things and a second sort of presidential or executive power that has uh, been been brought up uh, both actually by that by the Trump administration and the Biden administration is using uh, presidential authority for national security purpose to force a sale to say that that uh, the uh, TikTok so uh, while TikTok is owned by ByteDance which is a uh, Chinese uh, company it is actually you know, incorporated in America as a subsidiary that that operates here uh, and the idea was to force a sale to an American company uh, and then TikTok would you know live on uh, under this uh, this new company and uh, for for a brief moment uh, it was uh, sort of arbitrarily seemingly or, or capriciously perhaps uh, narrowed down to Oracle getting it which sort of seems strange you don't really think of Oracle as being a really ready to enter into the social media game uh, but uh, but that happened for a while uh, under the Trump administration the Biden administration has re-brought up this idea but uh, uh, not not just focused on on Oracle, so that is you know yet another way of moving forward to to go after TikTok. Um, I can. Yeah. I was just going to give details on um, on the Restrict Act in particular because I, I think that is that is what is in Congress and is um, not moving immediately. But as you may know, especially if you've been going to some of these other panels, the way that legislation gets passed now is um, everybody waits till the last possible second and there's a spending bill that has to get passed and or, or a defense bill that's another one um, bills that no one wants to vote against and then you just lard it up with whatever you want um, and it's the la last hour everyone votes for it boom and all of a sudden we have a bunch of laws that we actually didn't realize and weren't really properly vetted the Restrict Act um, could be one of those, but hopefully not, and not because we're going to tell you about it. Um, so I actually know what Restrict stands for because I looked it up. It is the Rethinking Emergency of Security Threats that Risk Information and Communications Technology. So let me just walk through what this is, and then we can actually get into the real meat of the panel, which is talking about the legality of all this stuff and what, whether we think it would pass muster in court. Um, so what it does, um, it actually applies to companies beyond TikTok, but everyone's calling it the TikTok ban because that's what's understood to be the main thing. But, you know, once it's on the books, it could be applied anywhere. Um, it says it authorizes the executive branch to block transactions or holdings of foreign adversaries that involve information and communication technologies and create an undue or unacceptable risk. So what does it mean to block? What does that mean? Well, really the language of the bill is they get to take mitigation measures. Mitigation measures to mitigate the undue or unacceptable risk. Um, it's not clear what those measures will be. It's also not clear what undue and unacceptable risk is, but we'll see. Um, but it'll probably be things like forcing removal of the app from, an app from app stores, maybe blocking the sale of a company, or forcing the, sorry, forcing the sale of a company. Um, it, but it's also not even limited to companies. It also includes um, broad powers to penalize um, individuals or companies that are participating in efforts to evade any such measures, so like VPNs uh, or using VPNs. Um, it has very limited role, oversight from Congress. Um, Congress has the ability to designate companies that will be targets or de-designate them. That's pretty much it. That's it. Um, and if you, um, 
for the most part, the executive branch does not have to explain why they're targeting somebody or not. They just have to say it's a risk to national security. And one of the things that happens in courts, let's say it's challenged in court, um, what national security has become magic words. And when you say national security, everyone goes, oh, well, then you don't have to explain. That's fine. We're good. Um, and because because if they did have to explain, then that would also risk national security. So we're in this like little loop here um, where we all just have to trust the executive branch to behave well. Um, and another thing is that it, it it's not supposed to target end users really, but you know if a, if um, the government is investigating a company as part of its mitigation measures, one of the things it's probably going to do is collect data. Um, about the users, and so ultimately that can affect lots of other pe people. Um, so EFF, as you might imagine, has a lot of concerns about this law, which we can get into in a second, but that's sort of, that's the one that's kind of most prominent and most likely to actually move um, if the sort of other executive orders um, don't go through. One of these things they're going to push, and then we're all going to go to court and fight about it. Uh, okay, to add on to that a little bit, um, why do we care? Uh, and this, I know that uh, I, uh, the data privacy issues with social media are, are legion. TikTok may be worse. It may be that uh, that government, uh, the Chinese government, is getting uh, data from TikTok, though TikTok strenuously uh, denies this. There have been at least allegations that there are uh, potential back doors in uh, some of the security of TikTok that would enable its parent company to get information and the TikTok company to be able to say, we don't give the information because, well, they're not giving it. Um, but, uh, you know, these are these are real concerns. There is at least a kernel of, of genuine concern here. But the problem with these bans is that the collateral damage is huge. It is, uh, you know, under, 100 plus, probably 150 million uh, Americans use it. Many more use it uh, all around the world. They use it to express themselves, to communicate with their friends and peers. Some people have built uh, you know, massive followings, are influencers, uh, have you know, made a career out of being a TikTok star. People are using it to gather information. So you have the, the free expression rights, not only of the people who are uh, using it and expressing themselves on it, but the, the right to read, the sort of the corollary of the First Amendment, which allows you to gather information. Uh, so that's all the people who are using it and gaining information by looking at other people's uh, TikToks. And all of this would be collateral damage. And if you have a ban, like so, one of the bans currently in effect, though it's being challenged or currently passed, in, is in Montana, and it says you know, no more, no more TikTok downloads, and there's a fine to any app store who allows those downloads. So if there's a new app update with a security fix, you know, well, if you're if you're in Montana, they want to make it so you can't get that. Uh, the, you know, the alternative would be to expect that everyone would immediately delete TikTok off of their phones, uh, which seems unlikely. So then that would mean as a practical matter, most of the ways a ban would be implemented uh, would have these collateral effects on security of not getting updates, of continuing to use outdated software, and, uh, you know, uh, that would be bad. Uh, that would perhaps even have a greater privacy and security risks associated with it than, uh, and, you know, the as, as yet unproven chances that it is being uh, delivered to the Chinese government. You can also say, well, is this the most effective way of doing it? And so we can get into that more in, in addition. But like, if you are actually trying in any good faith, serious manner to do something about data privacy and making sure that information on apps uh, are not going to governments, or at least not without due process that conforms with international human rights standards, why don't you pass a law to that effect for all social media? There is a there's a portion of this which is going after China in particular that is is rooted in current geopolitical conflicts uh, with with the U.S. and and China 
and it's being framed as if it's caring a lot about the the privacy and security of the people who are using TikTok. And I want those people to have privacy and security, but like the best way to do that would be things like guarantees of security that are technological, uh, you know, greater sets of, of you know use of, of encryption on communications. You could have end to end encryption for messages on there, for example, and make sure that the company doesn't have access to those. There are other ways to try to improve this and solve the problem but they're going after a particular subset of the problem with a particular company that sets a very bad precedent. And to that point, I mean, it, it's it, the geopolitical angle of it can't really be ignored because this is not just the isolated incident of TikTok. You, you've seen the FCC ban other Chinese companies from accessing our networks. And, and to my understanding, the D.C. Circuit has upheld those bans. Uh, I'm thinking ZTE and... Um, like the network infrastructure uh, right. equipment. Right. And so, I mean, it ultimately, has, you know, what you're seeing is singling out a single country or a single nation um, because of the geopolitical threat. Um, and, and that really can't be ignored. And it's not just a blanket. You know, we use the phrase content neutral when we start talking about First Amendment um, litigation, but it, it's really sort of a not really a question whether this is content neutral or not it is not neutral to the extent that it's isolated to a single foreign country and we're not talking about most other countries and we're talking about sure though i mean i i i I would differentiate that i mean i think that there there are elements of that in there but i think there's also the the elements of thinking about the the content of who's speaking that is, is taking away not necessarily a all the you know a particular category of speech, mm-hmm. but an entire means of communication and one which is a, a, a growing popularity, and that is another uh, you know aspect of, of sort of you know if you're doing the analysis of First Amendment law, when you take away a whole category of speech, um, and you know sort of imagine saying well, you know no longer can you speak using newspapers, uh, and say well this is this is this is content neutral well. That's not the point. You've taken away a whole category that is used by a lot of people. Um, very, very challenging stuff. Yeah. So let's just, let's just break down the, the sort of basic constitutional analysis to get us started, and then we can get to the finer points. I think that, uh, I mean, my view is restrict act anyway. Just sticking with that, or are all these in one flavor or another? You know, if we actually manage to get it to court and do the challenge of the First Amendment challenge, um, I think they go down. Um, the problem is. You can say this to staffers all day long, but I have come to learn, to my dismay, that you can go to people in Congress and you can say, you realize this is unconstitutional and it's going to get struck down eventually by a court. And they will say, meh, that's their problem. We'll worry about it later. And actually, it'll be like, actually, this is your problem, EFF. Good for you. Um, anyway, so so there, so there are um, First Amendment interests here, even if we treat it as, as a content-neutral regulation, meaning one way of thinking about that is it's not target, targeted to particular content, it's targeted to conduct, it's targeted at a company. Okay. Um, it still implicates the First Amendment um, because it implicates what basically you're affecting the right to receive information, as Kurt was already talking about. You also are affecting TikTok's ability to decide to disseminate information. And also you're taking away what, what courts call a necessary predicate to speech. And that's just basically a speech tool. You know, like a printing press or whatever. It's like these are tools for speech. And um, when that happens, courts have understood in the United States for a long, long time that implicates First Amendment concerns and therefore deserves at least what's called intermediate scrutiny. So intermediate scrutiny um, is sort of like what it sounds like. It's the middle level of scrutiny. And what it essentially asks is, okay, so you've got this law. We've got some First Amendment concerns here government, you need to show that this law that you have passed or this provision or whatever is narrowly tailored to the goal that you are trying to accomplish and that it does not substantially burden speech. It doesn't go substantially farther. It's not burdening more speech than necessary. So really what courts are saying is, okay, we'll live with some of this stuff, but you've got to show like this is really targeted to the harm and it's not going to burden, I don't know, the speech of millions of internet users, which it's going to. So like, we're kind of going to have a problem there right away. We just have to get there. Um, and um, so I think it's, it's unlikely 
that um, that I haven't seen any version of this law that seems to me would actually get there. Um, the problem is that you know it might sometimes it takes a little while to kind of gin up the lawsuit. In the meantime, we're kind of stuck with it. Um, but um, but also the other thing that can happen, of course, is that the government can use the threat of these orders and the threat of this law passing to accomplish what Biden wants, which is to domesticate the company in one way or another. So that is something where you could see, like companies are under pressure. They don't want to have to deal with this le legislation at all. So they might just, okay, fine. You know, it's like, it's blackmail. But either way, like, I think that's the basic constitutional analysis for this. Um, yeah, I think that that is uh, that is right, and I would note uh, that uh, one is a sort of a, you know for those uh, who are not very familiar with legal uh, procedure, a lot of this is going to come out in the form of uh, preliminary injunctions. So if these law as these laws get passed or executive actions are, are taken, that uh, people go to a court and ask for a preliminary injunction to have it be that that the the status quo is maintained and the law does not go into effect for the probably multiple you know years for it to wind its way through the courts and get any get a resolution uh, and that's a very important thing because if it goes into effect while while you're waiting for it to get a resolution then all the terrible things happen uh, and from from the company's point of view from TikTok's point of view if that if that happens then that probably is a lot of pressure to sell uh, if it is uh, still will be some pressure to sell in any event uh, and uh, so like for example I was talking about the 2020 executive order that there was a preliminary injunction there, um, and so it was. It did not go into uh, into effect, um, and uh, and it, therefore, you know, that may have contributed strongly to it not being sold to Oracle, uh, and then uh, you know it became moot. Um, the other thing I was going to say, just on the constitutionality, I think that there are some things that, like, uh, for example, if the federal government says no federal government machine can have TikTok on it. Like no no government issued phone can have TikTok. I think that is within their their grounds to say that you know uh, government phones are actually already highly uh, uh, restricted in what you can do with it. You have to use it you know only for for government business and, and things like that. Uh, and for security purposes, they lock them down pretty hard. So uh, that is sort of within its uh, purview. Um, and you know most uh, uh, people I know who work in the government carry two phones because their government phone is only to be used for one purpose and they don't want to commingle their personal lives with it. So it's probably a bad idea to put TikTok on your government phone even if they didn't ban it. Uh, and then another one that has come up here and I think is uh, debatable uh, and that is whether if there is government owned uh, infrastructure like a, a Wi-Fi whether it could uh, uh, block access to TikTok on that. Uh, when I say it's sort of uh, debatable or wobblers, I think that may be permissible if, like you're saying, like the Wi-Fi in the White House can't get TikTok. But uh, if you're saying on a state college campus and none of the students can use TikTok, that runs into some constitutional challenges. We have a, a question. Should we start with questions then? Get get that rolling. I'm good with questions. So. Yeah, yeah, line up before the mics. And I'll yeah. just tag on to what you said too yeah. a little bit. I mean, you, you mentioned the federal government. It's the same, obviously, the same analysis with the state government. If it's a state issued phone or, or device, it's their property. They can pretty well say you're not supposed to have TikTok mm -hmm. on on there. Maybe risk of adverse employment consequences. Right, and, they, and that's one where you could begin to start taking that, that test I said earlier about narrowly tailoring. Like, that's the kind of thing you could say, okay, well, maybe there will be an argument that w that, that is narrowly tailored to a particular goal. We're just talking about government employees because they may be at particular risk. Now, I'm not sure that that really sensibly applies to all government employees, but it starts making sense, right? That's the kind of narrower thing that you could imagine. Very different from... All American, you know, no one in the United States can use TikTok. Like that is, yeah. you know, then that is the government picking and choosing between communications technologies and saying like you can use this kind but not this kind. And that's I think where the court's going to get pretty right. skeptical. You're getting there. That's exactly in the direction that we're going in. So out of the employment circle, um, has anybody had an opinion or have you uh, heard any rumors about? Um, a state issued phone in the capacity of sometimes states will issue phones to populations of people that might be on food stamps or in um, other settings where they are trying to provide access and would that play into that at all? 
I've, I've dealt with that in other spaces, and you made me think about that right now. That's where they actually do own the phone, but they give it out to people to incentivize them to be able to call in and keep up with their government programs, whatever they're trying to access. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that that is also gets into that uh, question: of, Is that narrowly tailored? Is there an important uh, uh, purpose on it? And the the strongest argument is for like a government employee, especially like a government employee who might have particularly sensitive things in other ways on that very same phone to say that we're going to lock it down and not have any extraneous apps on it. But when you are saying to a, a population that uh, you've determined has had need for, for communications, cannot get it otherwise, but say, oh, only you can only communicate the way that we like, that starts to get over the line. I think, too, a, a concern of that is the slippery slope argument that you always run into. If, if, if you know, a state-issued phone to somebody on TANF, uh, is okay to block something. Well, what about the you know the state-sponsored broadband initiative? You know, you're using yeah. a a state-subsidized internet connection. Can they then say, well, you we can't use TikTok while you're on that network? Yeah, and with municipal, I mean, in many ways, municipal Wi-Fi is is often a good way of of you know pushing back against some of the uh, broadband monopolies. It's another issue that the EFF is worked on a lot but if that means also if you're going to use the you know city wi-fi it's only through the communications means that they deem acceptable that uh, that's a problem but we have a next question um howdy so i get why our legislators are trying to go after this both for uh countering espionage and presumably to deal with some of the threats that we've seen to uh, Chinese Americans and uh, a Chinese who happen to be studying here and uh, that some, some things that act a little bit like police stations have been uh, uncovered across the US that are targeting people of Chinese and Taiwanese descent. I, I, my question is, can, can things like this be effective can legislation like this actually be effective when uh, social media companies generally will sell uh, targeting information for advertising to a lot of other companies anyhow, and presumably China, uh, the government of China could either buy directly or indirectly a lot of that targeting data. Uh, would this just be a light roadblock that they would just drive around, or is there any way that this could actually make a real difference, particularly to people of Chinese descent who are potentially being targeted by the uh, government of the, um, of the PRC? So I think you've been reading EFF's blog. So I'm just going to say thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, but no, actually, I mean, it really gets to kind of the key thing here um, over and over and over. If you want to protect user data, then protect user data. Pass a law, not just for social media companies, pass a law, really comprehensive federal data privacy legislation. That is what needs to happen, and that protects everyone. And we need it for a million different reasons, most of which have nothing to do with China. Um, right now, you know, we got a corporate surveillance state that is sucking up information about all of us all the time, just waiting for the warrant or subpoena to get that information. Or even worse, lots of companies, yeah, it, companies and apps collect information and sell it to location data brokers, often without your knowledge or barely consent. I mean, it's a scandal. It's really shocking and appalling. And that's one of the reasons I worry about laws like this is we're going to get all distracted by talking about, you know, the First Amendment concerns and we have a legal challenge, blah, blah, blah. We will do something about China and everyone and let our Congress people will walk away thinking they did something. Well, meanwhile, actually what they really need, needed to do is not going to get done. And if, if, if the idea was to come up with an effective law to try and reduce China's ability to do surveillance on people in the United States, restricting data brokers from selling all this information to the highest bidder would be far more effective than, uh, than an attempt at a TikTok ban, and also a TikTok ban will probably end up being held un unconstitutional. I just want to add another thing on to that, which is that uh, uh, for, for people of Chinese uh, descent in the United States, often when they're communicating with someone back in China, WeChat is the is a communication method of choice. It's kind of what you have to do if you want to talk to someone who's in, in China. Um, and WeChat is really heavily surveilled by the, uh, the Chinese government. Like, 
much more so and much more obviously so than than TikTok. Some of these bands do also include uh, WeChat or other things, but there's a lot of them which are just like laser focused on TikTok. And uh, I, uh, that is another sign that they are not being narrowly uh, narrowly tailored. It would also be a a problem from a from a speech perspective to ban WeChat, even if people are using it. You know, uh, you know, it's definitely being surveilled by the Chinese government, because that is their method of communicating. They would be cutting off the ability to communicate with those folks. And unfortunately, the way the Chinese society is, is set up currently, there's a lot of surveillance on there. But like, also, if you use the regular telephone system to call into a authoritarian uh, uh, you know, surveillance uh, state, they're going to surveil that that too. And cutting off the ability to have any of those sorts of communications is very problematic. Hi, thank you for having this panel. And and, and to start with, are you all three lawyers? Okay, I just wanted to know. I'm a, I'm a lawyer too, so I wanted to like know. Uh, but. My question is actually a little bit more fundamental, and it might be outside the scope of the panel, but my question is if you think the specific threat, uh, threat, quotations, from TikTok, this one issue, if you think that is overblown or not, or if it's legitimate at all or not, and the reason I ask is I literally had an argument with my girlfriend about this a week ago, because she uses TikTok all the time, and I didn't like jump on her about it, but she asked me why I don't use it, and I explained that I wasn't really comfortable with some of what was happening with the data and with who was pulling the strings, and she like rolled her eyes and made me feel like I was wearing a tinfoil hat. So my question is, just in your own opinions, do you think this is something legitimate, or do you think it's something that is just being fabricated for purely political reasons? I would say that there there is some truth to it, and perhaps a better question, is it worse than the other social media apps that you, you might be using? Uh, because, uh, well, even yeah, your tinfoil hat won't protect you from them either. Uh, that's what she said. Yeah, I, the, you know, <laughs> that's, uh, there, you know, the connection to the Chinese government uh, is... Real in the sense that ByteDance is a company within China's power st structure, and if it does doesn't do what the Chinese power structure, you know, has to uh, uh, has to say, then ByteDance gets in trouble. So how much influence do they have on their American subsidiary TikTok? TikTok will tell you no. As I was mentioning earlier, that like it's been alleged at least that there might be ways in which people uh, can get into the data systems without asking for it, just going in there and grabbing some data, and as that has not been proven. I don't, I don't know if that is, that is true, and uh, uh, it, given how you could just buy a lot of this data from data brokers and such, maybe that would be actually not a, a very good exercise, but this is all sort of uh, uh, speculative. But there are, all of these concerns are present with like a lot of different apps, so I'm not sure that TikTok is noticeably worse than the rest but I mean it is not good on its privacy uh, practices uh, this is mitigated a little bit by a lot of the messaging that you would do and things that you do with TikTok are intended to be public so you know like it is if your purpose is to get your TikTok video out to the entirety of the world that's going to include uh, you know the, the the Chinese government, you know, even if it was completely secure, because that's the whole point of, of the messaging. So it's more about what extraneous information, like does it grab your your location when you don't say, you know, include your location and things, and whether the privacy settings that you have are ones that, that would be uh, expected. Uh, and there are ways to deal with that within, at least, the, you know, the U.S. If someone they, TikTok lies in its privacy policy about its practices and gets sued for that, then they will be liable, and, you know, the FTC can get in and do a consent degree and da-da-da-da-da. So, I don't know, I guess I'm, I'm not sure if I answered your question, but hopefully it's a little bit more information I don't know if there is an answer. I, I have one more point, and then I'm, I'm almost done. But I, because of something you said, my concern with TikTok is actually less about what they're taking than what they're pushing, and I don't know if this is something that law can even address, but I wanted to mention that because my concern has to do with some of the algorithm and the people behind it, and I don't even know if that's something that law can address, so that would be my last, my last uh, Oh, well, yeah, that's, um, 
we we go a long time on on that one because that brings it into uh, uh, section two thirty and algorithmic fairness and a uh, lot of other issues. But uh, you know, as with many social media companies or any one of of like you know particular size, rather than just giving you like the the videos that were posted by the people you follow in the order that they were posted right there's an algorithm that does this and i don't know much about the tiktok algorithms uh for some of the uh, other major company algorithms uh they say they don't know much about them that is say you know they have some inputs and outputs and it's machine learning and uh who knows what's inside, but they do have weights and they, they you know, they're, they're these sorts of uh, things which are within their rights to choose to do. Uh, and this is this, you know, you know, the content moderation issue is the government uh, can uh, not tell a company what to publish and what not to publish. Uh, and that would include any social media companies. Now, there are some laws trying to address that. Uh, there are some state laws, prom most prominently in Texas and Florida, that uh, have uh, been been trying to require uh, that uh, social media companies uh, over over a certain size and uh, originally, or actually, still in the law uh, in Florida, it was if they didn't own an amusement park, that's when Florida and Disney were more friendly. Um, <laughs> But uh, now they're not friendly. Uh, in any event, uh, would would have to publish certain things, uh, and that's that's unconstitutional in my view. And there was uh, actually a case, coincidentally, also in Florida about the Miami Herald, where they had to have a, they, they tried to put a law that would require it to publish op eds from various uh, you know from from political candidates, whether they wanted to or not. Uh, and uh, that was compelled speech, and so that was struck down by the Supreme Court. Um, so. I guess that's the legal issue is that yeah they can do they can do as they as they wish uh, on on terms of the algorithm, and then you have a, a separate issue: are they using that power wisely? Are they using that to spread disinformation or pro uh, government information or you know, pro Chinese government information, et cetera? Um, and uh, yeah, I don't I don't know of that algorithms, but algorithmic transparency would be an interesting thing to have to have for all the social media to get more transparency in what it is that they're pushing. And then to to that point, I, I did a panel the other night, and my phone sat out on the table just like it is right now. And uh, my TikTok is nothing but recipes uh, for the most part. I do a lot of cooking based off TikTok. And after our panel, things that we had talked about were showing up on Facebook, X, whatever we call it, and TikTok. And I had not Googled any of them. So um, the answer is probably yes and not yes, but, you know, you trust it at your own hazard. Hey, uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to start off by saying I think the TikTok thing is way overblown, almost purely political. I mean, that's just my own opinion. But my question is, uh, the thing that has surprised me the most watching this political process play out is the senators and politicians who normally are on the side of civil rights and civil liberties who have voted that, that way before, like Mark Warner and, and Michael Bennett, how for this one particular issue, they have just completely flipped and are now talking about banning some sort of speech communication. Um, how, why do you think that something like this would be the thing that would just totally take them away from how they voted before or how they have you know, stood for certain things in the past to you know, the exact opposite? Do you think any of them understand what TikTok is? <laughs> I, I, I don't think they do, yeah. I don't think they do. Uh, yeah, I think. Rock, rock. I think. I think the reality is yeah. when you go to Congress and you say national security, national security, national security, people start freaking out and they want to seem like they're doing something about it. And um, and it's easy. It's big fun to hate on big tech. It's almost as much big fun to hate on China, right? And so I, I really, I mean, I I realize it's a very cynical take, and I don't think of this about every piece of legislation. Um, this one, though, seems to me, or the Restrict Act in particular, seems to me so badly written and badly construed that it's hard to believe that it's really more than sort of a placeholder. Mm -hmm. um, and if you want to make you know, serious legislation to actually protect serious privacy, it's possible to do that. Um, and this just isn't that. And so mm -hmm. I think that, I, I really think it's a, it's a pretty cynical move. Yeah. 
um, and it's easy to beat up. And it's also, I think, I, I suspect it is also intended to be, um, as I was saying earlier, a form of blackmail. Mm -hmm. So we've got all these different things that's going to pressure TikTok in particular to basically domesticate. Yeah. And I just want to add on to I think, Ron, you hit, hit that pretty well, which is the, like, the technologies that Congress or Congress members don't understand uh, has historically been, you know, a, a challenge at regulating. And sometimes when they they don't understand it, the instinct is to is do it. And uh, at this point, perhaps uh, they are fairly familiar with so, like Facebook has been around long, long enough that they might have some idea how that works. Email certainly have some idea how that it works at least not the in, in, ins and outs uh, there was what the internet is a series of tubes um, <laughs> but uh tick tock right i think one of the things that makes it an, an easier target here uh is that it's something that is most used by the you know the latest generation teenagers are uh using it so it's something that their kids or grandkids are using that they don't quite understand doesn't make any sense to them and that also means by not using it, they're not thinking of it in the same way of it's like, and this is something which is important for speech and such. And like if you said ban Twitter, they're like, well, what, we have a Twitter account which we speak to our, our followers on, and I, used to anyway. an X account, and you know, um, an X Twitter account. Anyway, uh, but like for some of the technologies, like Facebook has is, is actually clearly been a very important player for, for uh, politicians because they're going on there and using it to target ads to uh, potential voters during election times and using and enjoying using all of that data that, that Facebook uh, has to target those ads very specifically. Uh, and so they sort of understand not only a little bit of how the technology works, but that it has value. But this thing that kids are like dancing to, uh, they just don't understand. Like, why would you do that? So it makes it easier. And then as Corinne said, you know, and then you, you, you put on the other side of the ledger, China, national security, they're coming after our children. And, you know, uh, it, it makes it, it easier to be um, uh, against. Right. And I, I think on, on that point, too, you know, I think we'd be having different conversations about different legislators pre-pandemic. I mean, you can't just discredit the idea that there isn't some sort of, okay, you know, we're responding to some sort of perceived notion, and people are angry, and we're trying to address people being angry so we, they do feel good legislation or what they think is feel good legislation, and that generation that's using TikTok is not their voters. Uh, and that's a very cynical view at it, but mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, it's got to play into it. Yep. Thank you. So I had a question. So right now there's sort of two trends. There, there's a, a really sort of newly assertive courts, Supreme Court, appellate court system. And at the same time, we're seeing also seeing the sort of rise of the shadow docket and courts intentionally not making bold stances on certain issues that they're afraid are you know, divisive, are you expecting the courts to formally weigh in on this TikTok thing, or do you expect them to, so should be looking towards the, the, the appellate court system, Supreme Court, for a really formal, you know, ruling on this, or do you expect them to try to sort of use that shadow docket to let their will be known without having to sort of make that formal ruling and proclamation? Um, well, the use of the shadow docket is a little bit hard hard to predict, yeah. um, for sure. I Well, actually, I will say courts have weighed in a little bit already. So there was the WeChat um, uh, ban. That was a legislation. That was an executive order. And um, there was a preliminary ruling from a district court anyway. They don't use shadow dockets. They just yeah. tell yeah. you what they think. They don't have that um, luxury. And, and there, that ended up getting resolved on the, on the Berman Amendment issue, which was – you know, what, did this exceed uh, the president's executive power? So it, it didn't hit the First Amendment stuff, but that doesn't mean it, it will get there sooner or later. And, um, you know, I think that if this passes and we go to court, um, it, you know, it could work its way up to the, to the Supreme Court. Um, it's hard to know what they are going to do. But I will say that, you know, they have been taking cases on um, tech and Section 230 
and the First Amendment, they have been taking those cases, they've been holding those hearings, they've been doing those rulings, and um, you know the the really core issues have not been squarely presented just yet. But I think the court's willing to do it. And um, and the thing that's funny though, I was just listening to this thing, this uh, replay of the oral argument over Section 230, and Elena Kagan, I think now quite famously, said, you know, we're not like nine tech experts. And so, and she, but she was taking that to me. And so maybe what we should be doing is being careful about when we opine about about technology. And, and, by, and I think that could be read as a sign that the court is open to the notion that um, when it comes to technology, maybe government should be kind of staying out of it. Um, that said, I, courts are often very, very pro-national security. And if you go in and you, we've seen these in our cases against the NSA at EFF, like if you go to court and you go in camera and you scare judges, um, you know, sometimes you can sway them. So I don't know. That's not, that's a very, it depends lawyer answer. I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> no, but, right. um, but. I don't. I don't know that we, it would end up in the shadow docket. I just don't know where it would. But like the First Amendment issues are really clear. Like right. you don't have to go far to figure this out. Like first year law student can figure out the problem here. I swear to God, you guys can all figure it out, right? We just said it, and you're like, yes, I get that. We're good. So it's not like this is one where I real. I realize that this is like the, like it's new tech and everything. But if we're actually in court, it won't be particularly hard to frame this as not being about, it's not a tech case, it's a plain old First Amendment case and in ways that I, I think judges will understand. I was just going to add on, on to that. Is another, of course, it's going to be, it, it depends. But the other thing it, it depends on is whether this pressure to domesticate or sell is, is successful. And uh, if, if it is, then TikTok will be owned by a, you know, uh, Apple Pie American uh, company. And uh, uh, a lot of these things will then go away without having had a legal, de or potentially could go away without having a legal determination. Because they do such a great job of protecting their data. Yeah. Right, just like all the other American companies, yeah. uh, they will. The national security element if it's all domestic, uh, somehow. I mean, it doesn't. <laughs> and from from other countries' perspective, that may increase the their national security element. Like this came up, uh, you know, it's between the EU and the United States, and uh, this advocate uh, Schrems in Europe has been causing a lot of trouble with data sharing between the EU and the United States because of the U.S. surveillance laws, and that how can you comply with the GDPR by sending your data to the U.S. And they're made various attempts to compromise on. Then Schrems goes in there and challenges it in the European uh, court system and has, has been successful a couple of times. Uh, uh, so yeah, from, from, from Europe's perspective, uh, having a, something owned by the U.S. does not necessarily mean their national security concerns yeah. are, or at least the Europeans, I guess, the, the, the countries are generally A-OK -okay with sending data to the U.S. It is their citizens who might be upset. <laughs> Thank you. All right, I promise there's going to be a question in here. Okay, so uh, a lot of news reporting on Russian influence operations in the United States, especially around the elections, which the executive responded to in part by leaning very heavily on U.S. companies like Facebook. So stuff doesn't just show up in Congress, right, like someone is actually pushing this and has been doing it for a while. My question is kind of the public rationale has always centered around privacy. Is this being driven for privacy concerns versus is it being driven because people in national security are concerned about a foreign government's influence operations through social media? Uh, I, I think there's some non-genuineness to their privacy concerns <laughs> illustrated by they are not doing several more obvious things to, do, to protect privacy. <laughs> Uh, so you can see why you're you know, looking for, for, for other answers. But if the true concern, well, I'll preface this with one other thing. I could make some guesses what a rational person would do. Uh, irrational people, it's hard to guess what they would do. So a rational actor could think of several other ways that would be more valuable at combating foreign disinformation than TikTok. TikTok is a method of communication, so it could be used for disinformation operations for sure. But it's targeted to people who are below voting age, so it's not 
perhaps the best one for, for targeting voting. And they had tremendous success with targeting things on the more well-established and, and larger user-based platforms, particularly f Facebook and, and uh, the, the company formerly known as Twitter. Um, and if one was going to, to try to like have an effect on foreign influence operations, there are like other means that would be better than, than a focused on TikTok ban. I mean, like just to put in just a, another uh, slightly off point example, but one of the complaints that was that like um, they hauled a bunch of people before Congress from you know, uh, executives at the foreign social media and said one of the questions that, that Congress thought was a like, gotcha, like. You know, do you accept rubles as as currency? As if the you know uh, Russian GRU does not know how to find like non rubles to pay for things, that they would be like aha, you know, Boris and Katasha or whatever like, uh, <laughs> and like so it's it's uh, it is a you know there's a genuine concerns about foreign information influence operations and having that that effect in there. There are also uh, concerns about having that. Uh, infringe on people's expression if, if uh, you know, uh, in, a, in a variety of ways. I mean, whether some of it is done with labeling, some of it is done with, with you know, disrupting those campaigns, but there's also, you know, if it is an, an American citizen who just happens to like Russia a lot, they still have the free speech right to do that, even if you don't think it's a good idea for that matter. So there's a lot of complex uh, issues there, but I guess getting back to your, your question, eh, probably not this one. Thank you. You know, there's also, there have been some studies that have come out recently. I, I just always want to say this every time it comes up because I don't think it gets publicized enough. I want to carry around a link or something. Anyway, um, or a QR code. <laughs> but there are studies that actually suggest that um, those misinformation campaigns are not nearly as influential as we fear. Um, that they tend to sway people who are already swayed and just sort of push them maybe more in that direction. And it's actually kind of a pretty small percentage of the population. Now, you know, that's research going backward, not forward. They get more sophisticated over time. But I just feel like that's worth saying because I think we sort of just assume um, that our um, elections are profoundly influenced by, like, the Russians. And I think they're more influenced by certain news organizations, news organizations that we could name. So, anyway. There's that. Some bad guys are incompetent too, so it's not. <laughs> uh, so I actually had a, a slightly more technical question about the mechanism that would be used to actually restrict a specific uh, company in this way, because not being a legal expert of any means myself, um, it's always been a little bit confusing to me that you could ever really target one company in the way that TikTok seems to be targeted, because if they you know have a headquarters in China, that's fine, but they could open an American branch and then. Well, they have. Move. Exactly. So I don't know how you would, uh, you know, regulate that in the way that people seem to be wanting to regulate it if they can just move around. Yeah, I mean, I, I, <laughs> there's so many different right, law, law, laws out there. You'd have to look at, like, each each one in particular. So, yeah. uh, but anything that, like, proposes <laughs> a, a, a ban on, like, TikTok by name, well, then you, you know, change the name. If right. it's TikTok by, you know, whatever uh, <laughs> uh, taxpayer ID number for the company, you know, they, they create a subsidiary and like there's a, and would those work? You know, you, uh, well-crafted law will, will try to, to stop that sort of thing. Um, but it, you know, that, that is a, a little bit of a, you know, cat and mouse uh, game. But some of that is the point is that like trying to get them to sell to a U.S. or like, if they're just about the money and like you know, TikTok is actually probably fairly valuable property that they could find somebody who wants to uh, wants to buy it and that might be easier than trying to <coughs> do those sorts of things. Um, and you know, if you're too cute by you know half and in, in, in we're doing that, it actually works out much worse for you. Courts don't really like it when you try some bullshit and, and say no, it's, it, it actually smells good. Uh, so it is a challenge, but like. Uh, the Montana was like, so don't, you know, download it to a Montanan citizen. So, uh, you know, you can then go 
somewhere else and get it like you, you, you probably won't effectively do this or right. you know or something it's done by geolocation and well vpns uh so like uh you know there's an old adage that uh, one of the uh, uh founders of eff uh, john gilmore said is the internet teaches censorship like damage and routes around it so uh that is that is going to be a challenge with with any kind of ban uh and uh you know it's sort of reminding me a bit one of the early things was, you know, there was a ban on exporting strong encryption uh, from the United States, and this led to two versions of, of browsers. So there would be the domestic version, which would have, what was at the time, strong encryption, and then a, an international version, which had weak encryption that was easily broken. And of course, it was trivial for someone to get, you know, the domestic version not outside the United States. It was more of a symbolic ban. But the legislatures may be looking for something like a symbolic ban, tell their voters, I've done something about this problem, than an effective one. And that's kind of my follow-up question is, you know, is this more about just browbeating them until they submit? Or is, you know, is the panel perhaps uh, confident that they could write <laughs> legislation themselves that could, you know, work through this? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, to do also expand on this, so that, that like one path of trying to solve around the, you know, you're targeting a particular company and they can change their name, they can sell it to a subsidiary, they can, you know, license it to a third party and so on, uh, is then you, you, instead of banning the company, you, like you ban the technology, like right. anyone is doing right. that technology. And then all of a sudden you've turned this targeted attack into something which is very threatening to any sort of expressive technology. That, you know, the raw concept of having, you know, something where you see short videos and spread it with your friends is already being used elsewhere. And we, we alluded line, to this, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, alluded to it earlier, uh, but a, a f part of the expressive rights that are involved here is the right to expression through code, through making an app that, that does all, you know, has these sets of features and that is, is part of the expression you have in, in, in the world. And anything which bans, like, a download of software uh, hits on those things, and like to to put it out into some level, which I think would be yet again clearly unconstitutional. If they got to the point where like, if TikTok put up its source code open source, and then you could just download it and compile it and run it, and that would be a very very clear speech violation if you tried to ban that from being published. And uh, you know, uh, uh, you can do things about commercial aspects, but if they made it available for free which you know they're making money on the ads not on the the, the download so um but that would be super dangerous to uh to go in that direction yeah yeah i appreciate it and i think the ads are actually why all of this is happening by the way i don't think it's a national security thing i think uh lobbyists from google and you know youtube and everybody else are feeling threatened and all of a sudden this is getting pushed through so but i appreciate the answer i really do uh it's uh, enlightening as always Mine will be fast. Uh, yeah, <laughs> um, last two questions. So uh, we have been talking a lot about uh, the Restrict Act, and I specifically am curious, um, you know, the national security risk is like the big thing. Specifically, how, as the people who are writing these kind of policies, how are they, like, what specific things, if there are any, are the national security risks of me posting video of my cat on TikTok? Like, what, like, what, how are they using that data in a national, like, what does that look like specifically? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's not the data that you're posting, right? That's supposed okay. to be public. It is that if there is extraneous data like your location, uh, your you know interests and, and whatnot that they have developed about it, uh, other user information in your profile that you've given to TikTok, or some of the idea that the private information that guy. So on on the videos, the public videos. Of course, the internet is about cat videos. Of course. Right? This is the reason we built this thing. Uh, and that should be, you know, it's not going to be, it's not the issue. Um, it is, theoretically at least, it's all the other information, which is the same thing that other social medias are, are gathering and monetizing. So, like, in the Restrict Act, is it all hypothetical situations? Like, I've, no, I've never read it before, right? And I figure you guys probably have. So, like... <coughs> What like what are these Congress people who maybe don't even know what they're talking about like citing as like this national security risk like I I don't know. so I think it's also um, and this is the part of it that's not completely bonkers that there is something there which is that it is true that China and Russia and lots of other companies countries including us 
are, you know, putting together, gathering and cross-referencing information from multiple databases um, to, you know, create profiles of populations. They don't care that much about individual people, mostly, except for there is an issue around Chinese citizens to some extent, but, the, um, but mostly they're, they're trying to create big map, maps so that then they can figure out how to target, um, not just even politically, but also sort of economically. Like um, China's gathering data from John Deere, swear to God, about um, farming and farming patterns and practices and crop planting and so on in the United States, which it then uses, its farmers use, um, in competing with us economically. So it is kind of, a, but it's, and, but TikTok is just a little piece. Like all this, right. we, there's cross-referencing information from all over the place. There was a great study in the UK where they, that, um, that actually did a map, and I don't totally understand how they did it technologically, but they were able to map like information coming from appliances in the United States and where it was going all over the world. And a lot of it was going to China. That's a thing that is happening in the world. But you know, it's like, Anyway, I, on our list of national security risks, though, it's hard for me to imagine this is like number one. Right. <laughs> but okay. um, that, I think, is what they're pointing to. Cool. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, very quickly. Very quickly. Uh, you started to touch on this earlier. Another very popular <clears throat> argument behind national security is protect the children. And so I'm curious to know if you think if they limited it similarly to what they did with, like, if you go to an alcohol website, you have to confirm that you're 21. Most app stores presumably have or could get the age data for their members to, and then could limit who's downloading apps by age. Do you think that would be more narrowly drawn and could actually pass constitutional muster? Mm, no, I don't think so. And for, for, because a lot of the reasons are still true mm -hmm. um, in terms of it, that would still be broader than it would need to be, right? It is because it would still affect lots of different people. Now, there are laws in place already under um, state law around um, you know, consent, and it, if you're under thir if your users are under 13, you have different obligations and restrictions on what you can collect and what you can't. It's actually, I think we sort of protect 10-year-olds minimally better than the rest of us. We should all have that much protection. Um, but I don't, I still don't think that would be narrow enough um, to get to pass muster. Cool, thanks. Yeah. All right, thank everybody for coming. And don't forget to rate the, rate the panel, go to the app and give.